Hi, Lara. Fruit flies. Hello. Hello. Ah! <laughs> I have never done that before. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Are we good? I, yeah, we're good. Are you good? Yes. No, Elliot, don't get off the internet. Our internet has been a bit uh, the last <laughs> week. Everyone's on it. Yeah, yeah. Everyone is Zooming all the time. Yeah. Have you been Zooming a lot? Elliot, you may actually have to get off the internet. I'm the only person watching right now. <laughs> uh, okay, I haven't been Zooming so much per se, but I spiritually feel as if I have been Zooming <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, I see the world through a Zoom window. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm wondering with what, interesting Zoom backgrounds. Yeah, at what point am I going to be... Hang on, let at, me turn this off. At what point am I going to be watching someone on TV and I start trying to type things at them or, or speak back to them? <laughs> We're going to get so used to talking to screens. I had like a... Um, oh, what was it the other day? We were like watching a movie or something and I had like this really visceral reaction where I was like, that's not how the world is. And I realized that it was like a reaction to like how the world is now as of like a month ago. Was it like, people, <laughs> was, like ah. was it people holding hands or something? Probably. I don't remember. I wish I could remember what it was. I just remember being like, uh, oh, you know what I think it was? I think it was like a Facebook memory. And I was like, oh, we used to go places <laughs> and take of things. Yeah. Do you find that it's um, changed, uh, that you've adapted to this quickly or that you're still sort of in denial about it? I think it took me a little while, uh, like probably the first three weeks, mm -hmm. I was like, <laughs> kind of losing my mind, like 75% of the time, I was like, this is fine. I used to work from home full time, like for two and a half years, mm -hmm. I had a full time job that was all remote, like the company was in Boston, and I was in New York. So I was like, Oh, working from home, I can do that. Right. But then it was like, I can't go anywhere when work is done. I'm just here. So 75% of the time I was like, this is fine. This is just like when I used to work at my old job. Mm -hmm. And then 25% of the time I was like, I need alone time. I need to go out. Right. I need to see people not on Zoom. Because yeah. after a while, it just like, like, you want to socialize, but then you're like, I have to socialize via video chat. Like, this yeah. is the worst. It's straight. I have Zoom to do my time. You're in a little one bedroom apartment with uh, with Elliot. Yes. I mean, you yeah, but at apartment, least it's but like it is... the. Can you get out on your fire escape at least? Yes, and we've been doing like cocktails on the fire escape huh? on Fridays. Yeah. Uh, and we had a little Easter picnic. Like I made focaccia, and we had like a weird sort of like focaccia and lox picnic. Okay. On the. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Jewish Italian, that's good. And our, our neighborhood is pretty quiet, so getting mm -hmm. out to go for a walk. I went for a nighttime walk the other day, which okay. was really nice. Yeah. Like, people are always like, oh, don't walk in the park at night in New York. And I was like, well, no one is out right now, right. so. That would make me wonder. What if I do? I mean, it was pretty, like, it was weird. It was sort of like being in a movie set, mm -hmm. and there were some moments where I was kind of yeah. weirded out because there were yeah. no people. Right. There was absolutely no right. one. Um, and those were the moments where I was like, I could get murdered right now. No one would realize. <laughs> but then I saw, like, a mom and her daughter out mm -hmm. walking who had clearly had the same idea. Because when we try to go out at, like, 5, mm -hmm. everyone has gotten off work. And so they're like, oh, I need to go outside. And it's crazily crowded so nighttime is huh. kind of the the best time to do it i think yeah it's here i i sort of would go out and there's still lots of homeless people in the quarter who don't have this usual amount of tourists to uh to to go after so uh i think that i'm i worry that they're kind of getting more desperate and, and uh, uh aggressive um but it does, I mean, here, I mean, obviously, it really looks like a film set here. It's kind of weird. I feel like, you know, this could be 1853 yeah. and the yellow fever epidemic or something. I feel like at 
the beginning of this, I was talking to a friend about how I expected it to be like the 1918 flu epidemic. And they were like, no, here are all the reasons that it's different from the 1918 yeah. flu epidemic. And then like two weeks later, they were like, it's just like the 1918 <laughs> flu epidemic. Yeah, I, well, I'm curious. So your, your novels, the three that you've published so far, take place in a, in a fictional place that's based, loosely based on the 20s and 30s, right, in Europe. Um, did you read anything about the 1918 pandemic before this? No, and actually it's one of those things in history that I feel like, and I felt like this a little bit about World War I for a while, because I did a bunch of research for World War I for a different story I was working on. And I was like, why does, why is America like obsessed with World War II stories? Like, why does no one ever talk about World War I? It's got a lot of stuff going on. And the flu epidemic now, I'm like, wow, actually lots of people talk about World War I not a lot of people talk about the fact that there was like a global pandemic during yeah. World War One, And I think the only place that I've like seen it in media is in the beginning of Downton Abbey. Like people get the flu. I think oh, somebody yeah. probably dies. Some, I think there's an episode. Someone in the succession dies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I've also read around because everyone is like talking about uh, global pandemics and like pandemics in history um, and comparing COVID-19 to the 1918 pandemic. Like someone in the publishing community was talking about how will this epidemic show up in literature in the future? And they talked about how the 1918 flu pandemic is not featured right. in any of the contemporary literature of the time. Like people just didn't want P pale horse, pale to rider talk the about it. novel that's about it. Yeah, it's just like people were like, well, that's over. I never want to think about that again. And frankly, like relatable <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. I, the book I'm working on right now is just like, I don't even know if this is going to be relevant when this is over. But hopefully everyone will just be like, that happened. Let's like, let's forget about it and move on. Is the book but, set in the present? I mean, <laughs> it is set in the present. I'm actually... I want to roll back and be like, I actually hope that people don't say, let's forget about that and move on. Because I think there's a lot of interesting stuff uh, to be mined from this experience, mm -hmm. or there will be. Did I freeze? I look like I've frozen. A little bit, yeah. But you've, you've frozen in an authoritative way. Okay, hello? Oh, now I can't hear you. Can't hear you at all. Hello. I don't know why. Lyra. Okay, she's left, so she'll probably log back on. Sorry about that. Everyone's on the internet, as you know, so we've been having lots of problems with connectivity. Okay. Oh, thanks for the plant compliment. That's that's all due to uh, Sarah. That's all Sarah's doing. She's the she's the one who's attempting to to grow a little indoor jungle here. I'm back. Hi. Um, and I can hear you now. Uh, you were saying there's lots of interesting experiences. Yes, to be I'm back. From this. Yes. So I hope we don't like forget about it and uh, and and just like move on. The so. I was talking with a writer friend today who saw some stuff come through her MFA workshop. Oh no. Oh. Yeah, you keep freezing up. Hmm. Any thoughts on what to do here, Lara? She's gone away again. I'll show you the, here's the lovely view today. Okay. okay. I switched. All right. Switch to my data. I'm not using my Wi-Fi anymore. Okay. So 
I'll bill you <laughs> when my cell phone bill comes in. Um, right, he was in an MFA workshop and said that there was a piece that came through the workshop the other day that was someone's just literally their COVID diary of yeah. like, this is my life. That is story. It's just what all of us are experiencing right now. No one wants yeah. to read this. Yeah, it's, I was wondering that like, in after i mean people are comparing this to september 11th obviously after september 11th quite soon after there were a lot of um books that like dealt with what that day was like um i think saturday by ian McEwen had something to do with that uh well, the first one i think was um what's his name um gibson william gibson he was in the middle of writing a novel when it happened and he added it to the novel um but with something like this where like you've got millions of people around the planet just sitting indoors. It's not um, easy to see how that could work into a compelling narrative, is it? Yeah, like it, it's not so, you, I was gonna say it's not so dramatic, but then I thought of my favorite 9-11 uh, novel, <laughs> which is I guess a genre of novels, um, which is the, I almost hesitate to say the title, for me, I went into it not knowing that it was a 9-11 novel. Mm -hmm. And so I was like reading along and being like, ah, oh, yes, a sort of like New York high society drama. Oh, I know is it, I where this I know is going. Is. I've like read enough of these. Hello? We'll come back afterwards. Yeah. But I was like, I've read enough of these types of stories mm -hmm. to know where the story is going. And then 9-11 right. happens and it's like, oh my God, all of the results that I expected are not the results that I'm going to get because this cataclysmic thing happened to these people. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, COVID is kind of that. Like if you were expecting your life to do one thing right. and then this pandemic happens and like you're socially dead or you lose your job or like a family member dies, that could throw your expectations off entirely. So like in a sense, in the same way that this other author used 9-11 in mm -hmm. her book, which she got a lot of flack for. People were like, it's so cheap that you would use this happen to people as like a plot device. But I thought it was really powerful. I mean, it it's, a, it's, a, it's very much like, yeah, yeah. that did. It's a, re it's a real <laughs> Deus, Ex, Deus Ex Machina. Yeah. It's like a legit yes. one. It's, it's what they uh, tell you not to do in, really in, in fiction yeah. classes. Right? It's a Deus right. Ex Hello? Yeah, yeah, they're like, you can't do that. That doesn't seem realistic. Well, mm -hmm. real, real life is not. You're skipping again. All right. Are we in sync? Are we back? I think so. Um, it goes crazy when you move too uh, much, I think. I don't know. It's I think Instagram happy hours right now. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of people doing this. It goes this crazy when I what? When you move too much, I don't know. Is that what it's doing? Oh. Yeah, it's all because when... Hmm. Well, I had to plug my phone in because the video is draining. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Oh man, I can't hear you again. I'll show, um, I don't know, I guess it's Lara coming back. Oh, she left. Okay, she's left, so she'll probably come back again. 
Um, sorry for all the technical problems. Everyone is on the internet at the same time now. And I don't think even the great Instagram, Facebook uh, consortium is just prepared for this. Ah, nope. Sorry, I'm not going live with anyone else but Lara. Hmm. Okay, waiting on her. Hello? Can I, I can see you now. Can I? We're trying. Hi. Okay. Okay, continue. <laughs> Oh, you're frozen again, damn it. Hello. Oh, balls. Invite Elliot. Ah, okay. Okay, we'll try Elliot's phone. Hello. Okay. How about have now? Better, have better connectivity? Oh, it looks like it. Yes. Also, his phone is way better than mine in every way conceivable. So. Oh, wow. I have plugged it in, Elliot. All is well. All right. Thank you, Elliot, for rescuing us. Um, so, you were saying. What was I saying? We were oh. talking about fiction and something like this happening in in, in a story. We and were talking about. Work this into. A work of fiction. Yes. Hang on. We're charging this phone. Uh, I was talking about my favorite 9-11 novel um, and how it uses 9-11 as, as we said, a day's ex machina and how real life is unpredictable and not necessarily believable as fiction most of right. the time. Yeah. So if anyone uses this in fiction, I guess that's kind of what I would expect to see is like how it functions as a disruption yeah. in the lives of the characters who are living it. I mean, I imagine it would be good fodder for like plays. Mm. You could have a two person show of pe people in a, an apartment and could get sort of go crazy from there. I don't know how well that would work in a, in a novel format. Um, oh, this actually reminds difficult me. difficult to do that at length. I think. I mean, I so I just read this book, uh, which I think I mentioned to you earlier, called The Rehearsal by Eleanor mm -hmm. Catton. And it is a book that I knew nothing about when I opened it up. Yes. And it was like watching a play, except I was reading a book. Like oh. the way that it is written makes you feel a little like you're reading a script and a little like you're watching a play. Uh, oh. And it was, it was like Is that just because it's lots weird. of dialogue? There's a lot of dialogue, but then parts of the book are like descriptions of scenes as if they're happening on stage in a way that plays can do it that books really can't. So you would have two characters in a scene and a, one of the characters would start describing another scene. And then the book would be like, and the lights do this and the sound does this huh. and the and describes the one character like taking on the aspect of another character like they're doing an impression huh. and you could see it as if it was happening on a stage where it's like we're in one scene but we're having a sort of transition to another scene and we know it because there are these cues from from like the tech side of right. of the theatrical experience it's really cool it was a really huh. cool book and it was that you felt you felt that it was an effective style. Yeah, yeah. I, it's like nothing I have ever read before, um, and it, it definitely could have been a bit gimmicky. But I think because I went into it being like, well, someone told me I'd like this book because it's like the secret history, which it's not. But <laughs> but they were like, you like that book, you'll like this book, and that was <laughs> all I knew about it. Uh, and once I got into it, I was like, this is weird. This is not what I expected, but it is very effective in what it's doing. I have a question for you. When you're writing and you're writing a novel, do you imagine it as a movie while you're writing it? Yeah. Yeah? 
Yeah, I actually do. And it took me a while to realize that other people don't do this. Mm. Um, and it's been really interesting in doing teaching and thesis advising, which is what I've been doing the last like year or two, to realize that my students don't necessarily do this. Or if they do, they do it in a different way. Um, and it's sort of like seeing other people's problem solving processes, like from the inside, you realize that their brain is not completing the same task the same way that yours is. Uh, but for me, if I know what a scene is, if I know where it is and who's there, it's like it, I can see it. Uh, and it's very strange to me when other people have like a hard time describing the setting or describing the characters because I'm like, I'm there, I'm watching it. It's just happening in my brain. And I'm basically like describing the things that I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, that's it. I mean, I feel like I do the same. The one time that I've tried writing fiction, you're the only person who's read it. Um, I, the whole time I did often sort of slip into thinking that I was watching a movie. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think know that's... if that's just, I mean, obviously people, I wonder if people used to think that they were watching a play when they were writing novels or imagining you know, imagine what it would be like staged or something. It's it's strange. I I don't talk to enough fiction writers to know how many of them think that way and how many of them don't. Do you think that this is just like a, it's just something some people have because they watch too many movies or what? I think, so that one of my favorite craft books is called Storyteller by Kate Wilhelm. Oh, look, guest starring appearance by Elliot. And getting the cat off of the dining nice. table. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's this book by Kate Wilhelm called Storyteller. Um, and it's like part craft book, part the story of how she founded this famous science fiction workshop called Clarion. And in the craft part, she talks about her idea that there are two kinds of writers when it comes to description. There are visualizers and constructionists. And she's like, visualizers, the exercise she uses to distinguish between the two is she'll be like, ask your students to visualize, or not visualize, just like, tell your students to imagine someone walking upstairs and give them five seconds or less. Just be like, imagine someone walking upstairs. And then after five seconds, be like, write down everything that you know about this scene. And she says, usually there'll be two different reactions. There'll be students who were like, it was a woman in a red dress and she was walking up a pair of like a, a cement set of stairs uh, mm -hmm. outside and it was raining and there were mm -hmm. like leafless trees and she clearly had come from something fancy, but it like now her ball gown is all wet and ruined. And you're like, wow, that's a lot for five seconds and right. someone walking upstairs. And then there'll be students who were like, what? where are the stairs? Who's the person? Like what, what are all of the contextual clues that I need? And the people who have the really strong visual image immediately, she calls visualizers. And the people who are like, I can't picture it until I know why are the constructionists. And the problems that they have are like visualizers because they see it so clearly sometimes will under describe because they're expecting everyone else to see the picture that they have so clearly in their head. Oh. And constructionists will often give way too many details because they don't know which of the details are important. Because they're just like, oh. I know what's important in the scene, but how do I like show it to people? I don't know. So I'll just tell you everything that's probably there. And you're a visualizer. I think so. But I also take a lot of pleasure in describing mm. like the physical world around my characters. Yeah. Uh, but I don't, I never feel like I'm floundering for what details to provide. So like, Kate says that constructionists often will be unsure what, what physical details they should put into the scene because they're like, those don't feel important to me, but I know that people want them. So here's some random details. Okay. To me, I'm like, I know exactly what detail is important in this scene and I'm going to lavishly describe it. Uh huh. Interesting. I wonder, so you're, you also are a visual artist. Um, I'll show this lovely drawing that you did of me and Sarah, which is the end of our fridge and we love. I like how you captured my swarthiness. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I'm now trying to practice sketching and painting and things like that, uh, just 
it's something I started before this just to kind of, uh, I don't know, divert my uh, creative attentions in a different direction. What's the, what do you think the relationship is between your visual understanding in literature and your um, proficiency at, at visual art? I think, like, I always wanted to be an artist from when I was very small. My mother is also an artist. Um, I think she might be watching this live stream. Hello, mom, if you're there. Um, oh, and thank you. To, thank you to your mom for sending Sarah a very sweet note. Oh, she did? Yeah. Aw, mom. Uh, so yeah, she's a visual artist, an amazing visual artist. And I wanted to be an artist from very small and even had like applied to a bunch of art schools when I was going to college. And I went to do a portfolio review at the Savannah College of Art and Design. And I wanted to go into fashion That's design. That's for Sarah It's amazing. I mean, it was amazing to do a, a campus tour. I don't know what it was like to actually go there. But when I did the portfolio review and was like, fashion design, the woman who looked at the portfolio was like, there's so much work that goes into the people who are wearing these clothes mm -hmm. like perhaps you should consider concept art instead mm -hmm. like when you do like character design and concept art for films or video games mm -hmm. and i was like oh that's true yeah i think a lot about the people who are wearing the outfits mm -hmm. uh and i like i eventually right before i had to decide what college i was going to go to was like i actually want to get an english degree and not an art degree but I still like did a bunch of art when I was in school and I do it now and I think for me it was always like whatever art I was making I was also thinking about the story behind the art like what is happening here who is this person why are they doing this why are they wearing this so like the art was always an expression of a story that was already there or that was developing as I made the art do you um do you think you're uh, better at writing or better at, at drawing? Oh, absolutely better at writing. <laughs> absolutely and, better and at writing. Do you think that's natural or just, or just a, um, a matter of practice and craft? It's probably a matter of practice. Like I could probably get better at art if I did it as much as I do writing. But I wonder if the, not the like risk reward, but the effort that needs to go into it mm. i and also you can talk about writing craft right so mm -hmm. you can talk about how you do things in writing with words yeah which is easier especially right now is much easier than like going to an art class and like mm -hmm. watching other people do art I mean, probably actually there are a bunch of online like video stream art classes that I could theoretically go to, but. I mean, I've been doing YouTube tutorials to learn how to use watercolors and stuff. I mean, it works. Oh no, should I be like improving my art skills? Through no, 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 you're doing anything <laughs> you don't want to do right now. Uh, maybe it's just that I find it less effortful and more enjoyable to have conversations about writing craft mm -hmm. than I do to like, pursue ways to improve my visual art. I am working on a watercolor right now, um, which is mostly like trial and error, mm -hmm. uh, which I guess was what my writing career was for a while. It was like trial and error. Like, oh, try this. Does it work? I don't know. Someone needs to read it and tell me. Right. Uh, but it, it feels more accessible now to just be like, oh, I know enough about writing that I can actually talk about it in this very like, weird intellectual like granular way where you like break down craft elements and my art is just sort of like who would poke it with a brush and and right. see what happens well it's interesting you mentioned that because i mean it's it's writing is supposed to be a very solitary pursuit but you're talking about it in terms of what's good to talk about what works for you to talk about with other people um it seems like i mean that's i don't think to you. i don't think that i could write without other people obviously when you sit down to mm -hmm. do the writing it's not helpful necessarily to have other people around to talk to but to figure out like if you're stuck or if you don't know where to go next or just like how did that one author do this amazing thing like how did it work how can mm -hmm. i use it like a lot of that has to happen for me at least talking to people even doing critique of other people's writing 
it's very hard for me to read a story and think about what's wrong with it and then write down the critique for the author. Like okay. I function much better when I can have a conversation about mm -hmm. the piece. And, and even writing essays, like apparently when you write a novel and you have to promote it, a huge part of that promotion is like writing essays. I'm like, novelists are not essayists. Right? It's, it's two different skills. <laughs> but apparently yeah. now I have to write all these promotional essays and to write them, I have to have someone to talk to. I can't just do it from my head. I have to like say my thesis statement and then like work through why I support it and then like revise it all verbally or, or in text. Like I'll text. What kind of essays forward. are they expecting you to write? I wrote an entire essay about fascism okay. <laughs> because my first book was like about a, a fascist takeover of the government right. that happened right after like the book came out right after Donald Trump had been elected. Uh, and I was like, oh, I guess now I have to write all of these promotional essays somehow talking about like the history of fascism and like fascism in America, right. which I am not qualified to do. Um, right. But like a anything, honestly, they're just like, can you write a piece for our blog? And sometimes yeah. they'll give you an idea. Like Mary Robinette Kowal has this great thing on her blog where she asks authors to talk about their favorite piece of the thing that they've written. So like, what was your favorite thing about the book that you wrote? Uh, or John Scalzi has one called The Big Idea, where he's like, what's the big idea of this book? Um, okay. So sometimes they'll give you like an idea. Other times they're like, will you just write something for us about yeah. anything? It's so like, I have to write an essay about Star Wars okay. for, for a a website that was doing like a series of, we asked this author what Star Wars means to them. And I was like, I don't know. I like it. I, yeah. And I had literally had to come up with like an, an emotional, meaningful, like this is what Star Wars means to me. Wow. And I had to talk to people about it because I don't think I naturally like plumb mm. those depths. I'll read okay. a story and I'll be like, I liked it. And right. people will be like, why? And I won't be able to articulate why oh, until I'm in conversation. Yet. Was it good? Was it bad? I don't know. I read it and I liked it. Oh, don't so make it, me defend it. This sounds like it's it's like it sounds like it's your editor or your agent basically saying write something topical so we can keep your name in in search engines. Yeah, uh, and link to your book. You know, preferably something topical that's also about your novel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Which is very weird when you think about it. It's like, can you take something from the latest news cycle and somehow connect right. it to your novel that took yeah. you like three years to write? Well, it's like, um, uh, I guess they're tr they, people like the idea of a novelist being a kind of public intellectual also, right? They've come to sort of expect that, I think. Um, right, what Sh Shelley said that... Uh, um, writers are the unacknowledged legislators, poets mm. are the unacknowledged legislators. And I think that kind of, um, I think writers like to think they are. So I think you have a lot of writers who, or some writers do. I mean, you know, Not right? me. I'm like, everyone's I just been, want to write my been book. passing around the Arundhati Roy uh, essay about this thing. And she's like the prime example of a writer, a novelist who writes essays about politics and stuff like that. Um, but I don't, yeah, I don't know if I, I mean, not that anyone's asked me to write anything about you know, dandyism in, in, in coronavirus, but I don't know, I, I would feel weirdly like unqualified to write about certain things, I guess. Yeah, I mean, for me, like, like I said, essay writing and like op-ed writing, public opinion having, to mm -hmm. me is a really different genre of writing than writing right. fiction. But, so like, I don't know how familiar you are with publishing Twitter, especially like YA or science fiction and fantasy. Yeah, I try Twitter. to avoid it. Good, you should. It's terrible. Yeah. Uh, I have resolved to have a takeless 2020. My Twitter <laughs> is just like, look at this food I made. Here's a cute picture of my cat. Right. But there is like a weird subset of specifically YA and science fiction, but I think probably uh, there are a lot of like readers and and people who are sort of publishing adjacent who kind of get in on this, where it's like if you have a book, somehow you're like tied into having an opinion on like social issues mm -hmm. and it has to be the right one 
or you'll be canceled and no one will read your book. Mm -hmm. And it's very stressful. Like most of the writers that I know have sort of resolved to not talk about things on Twitter. They're like, I don't oh. really want to have an opinion on the internet about yeah. anything because no matter what it is, someone out there is going to be like, well, no one buy your book. Your book should be like taken off the market. Yeah. You're probably garbage and a pedophile. Like that, <laughs> that is, that is the discourse right. about Does, books. Does it affect the books that people are writing too, you think? I think I mean, I in know a way. The controversies, the controversies in YA about representation and things like that. Um, I think like there are ways that it does and ways that it doesn't. And unfortunately, I think the ways that it does are like not useful and the ways mm -hmm. that it doesn't are the ones that it really should be changing. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of like superficial push toward like, we have to have diversity. And there's no actual push towards like, what if publishing were a more diverse field? Or like, what if we hired editors who had more diverse experience and acquired books by like, people like, I, it's hard to it's hard to talk about in just like an Instagram live because it's like sure. a big thing. Uh, but I think that it's sort of it's led to a very like, frightened um, reactionary sort of like, Oh, well, the book will get canceled if it's problematic. So mm -hmm. we have to make sure not to be problematic, but in the most like milk toast ineffectual way. Mm -hmm. Like it's right. not the actions people are taking are not effortful or meaningful. Mm -hmm. And then when things get bad, like the first people to get thrown under a bus are usually like, queer people of color who've like written something from their own experience and then people are like this is toxic destroy it oh god or if like i don't know if a book that is actually like has an issue mm -hmm. uh that could have been addressed by a sensitivity reader that the publisher didn't hire then it's like oh well, we'll wait for the fuss to die down and just reschedule it for later so so that no one like remembers that this book was a big toxic twitter mess it's just very complicated and upsetting and has led to yeah. a lot of really good writers that I know just disengaging from like the Twitter community. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, disengaging from the Twitter community, I think is, is could be a very good thing. I, I don't know, as long as people aren't disengaging from their writing. I mean, that's what I would be afraid of. Or more to what you just said, I think, like people just deciding, okay, well then I'm not going to address any anything in my books. So instead of, um, you know, taking on any subjects, I'll just write a really kind of bland thing or I'll just, yeah, it, I won't, I, I won't engage with any issues at all. Yes. Right yeah. So um, I think this is another consequence of this situation hmm. is that a lot of people are like, Oh, I can't talk about that yeah. in my writing because it will lead to a giant blow up and my book will be canceled. And then I'll never be able to publish a book again. Um, but they might have something interesting to say about it. But they might have something interesting to say about it. Um, and I think that people who are, there are like two sides of this. Uh, I think the people who are most concerned about messing up are the people who do have interesting things to say about whatever topic. The people who don't care at all are going to do what they're going to do no matter what. Right. Um, but then there are the people who like, don't necessarily have an interesting thing to say, but feel like they need to say it anyway. And then don't listen when other people are like, oh, mm. is that really a thing that you need to be saying right now? Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, I thought it was cool, so I'm gonna do it anyway. And mm -hmm. then someone in their publishing company is like, yeah, we should do it. Like we won't publish the book by the person who has the genuinely interesting if thorny thing to talk about mm -hmm. but we will publish the book by like the person who makes us feel comfortable who we're like yeah that's what i thought about that thorny issue too even uh, though okay. i have no personal experience of it uh, i see interesting do you think um that writers always need to i mean you write fantasy and science fiction or you write in that world do you think writers need to write from personal experience or do you think i mean well, how much leeway is, is there you've invented whole worlds I think, so I think you are always writing from personal experience when you write, because you're drawing on like your understanding 
of your experience of the world, mm -hmm. whether that's like interaction with other people or things that have happened to you or just like, I walked down the street and this was my physical experience of walking down the street. Like you're always drawing on the way that you experience the world, mm -hmm. but you experience the world in your really unique way. And when you are writing about someone who experiences it in a way that is probably markedly different from you, I mean, like in fantasy world, of course it's gonna be markedly different from you because like it's a world that doesn't exist. Mm. But I think if like you're writing, so one of the reasons I like writing about fantasy, God, I do this all the time. Whenever I'm teaching, I feel really bad because I'll be like, I started a sentence. I'm gonna stop in the middle of the sentence before finishing it and then start a new one. That's okay. Um, I've been watching Joe Biden, it's okay. Well, just wander. <laughs> Forget what I'm saying. Um, okay, so one of the reasons I like to write fantasy uh, is because it lets you take systems you have observed in the real world and strip them of all identifying characteristics and then build a new reality on top of them. But you keep the fantasy world feeling real because people recognize like, oh yeah, that is the way things work. Right? That is how people talk to one another. That is how government functions. That is the thing that I was angry about. Like, you take things people recognize the shape of, and you change the details. And I think the issues kind of arise when you are taking systems that you are not necessarily a part of or affected by and you're like, I recognize this from the real world. I'm just gonna like take all the details off of it and put it in my fantasy world with some new details and not think about like the subtext of what that means. So like if you took a, a system of oppression from the real world, right? Like the slave trade or patriarchy and you were like, I'm just gonna put it in my book, but flip it. <laughs> and it's okay. like, okay hold on, <laughs> like, yes, that's a system that we recognize, but you have just like taken everything about it that makes it like painful and affecting and like really real and been like, and I'll, I'll just flip it around and then like won't engage with the fact that I've done that and will expect people to read it and just be like, yes, I understand. This is like a bad thing from my world, but now it's Right. bad for the other person like nuance is really important when you do this kind of thing mm -hmm. uh so like i had a gender flipped society in armistice where it's like it's a matriarchy it's a mm -hmm. it's a monarchy but it has a queen and like women are in power um i stole this idea there are like a lot of cultures around the world where like when you are a widow you cannot remarry in right. fact, you should probably kill yourself, right? right? Like, it's an incredibly sort of ingrained and an awful piece of particular kinds of patriarchy around the world. And I was like, I will do that, but I will change it. And I was really nervous when I was doing this because I was like, surely someone will be like, you can't just do that. Like, haven't you thought about, I don't know. I was scared about it because of this like weird Twitter situation where people are like very ready to, to point out sure. things like this. But I also think that like, it throws an interesting light on how people actually live in those systems. Like mm -hmm. the rules of the system are X, Y, Z, but it is filled with like real people uh, who do weird, inexplicable real people things. Like we said, like real life does not look like fiction most of the time. Right. Um, I don't really know where I'm going with this, except that when you take, when you take systems or shapes from real life, I think you have to really engage with them in a, like, this is what it looks like, but what are the, what are the like weird things about it? Or like, what are the nuances of it? And by changing it, what am I saying about it? Like, if I'm going to take something and gender flip it, like, what does that mean? I can't just do it and then be like, oh, look, it's different. Right. Um, like, I've, I've definitely read stories where my critique has been like, I see what you did here. But like, 
why right. like what are yeah. you saying about the thing that you that you have mm. that you've done yeah do you um uh i had a, a question on this topic and i forgot what it was um, sorry i just rambled for like a thousand years try i was really trying hard to come to a point instead of just trailing <laughs> off no that's okay oh did it <laughs> elliot is now quoting my own book to me to be like this is what you said that made that whole gender flip thing really work and i'm like okay i don't i don't remember i wrote that book in three months like probably i said something yeah well to to what extent does research then fill that need of being able to engage with something that you might not directly experience and being able to use that in your story. Mm, I think, wow, I don't know. Because for me, research is like, what happens if you have a punctured intestine and antibiotics haven't been invented yet? Like, uh -huh. <laughs> that's usually the research that I end up doing. Or like, mm. when were table lighters invented? Uh, okay. And for me, like research around stuff like this is less or or like a lot of the research that was very useful to me, at least in writing this trilogy, the Amberlo dossier, was like research about politics and the way that people mm -hmm. inhabit politics. So it was less about like, I'm going to write a society that's like gender flipped and it's a matriarchy and like women have power and like widowers can't remarry and men are sort of barred from like serious pursuits. Because to me, I'm like, well, I experienced the patriarchy and this is what it's like. So if I'm going to write a gender flipped society that's a matriarchy instead, I can write pretty honestly from like, this is what it's like and it sucked while oh. keeping in mind that there are like key differences mm -hmm. between oh god i'm gonna start talking about the gender binary uh between men and women or like people who exist outside of the gender binary and like how so like how does the matriarchy work if like women can have children because like part of patriarchy is the is sort of surrounding like oh women's role is like to have to bear children and raise them but if it's a matriarchy women are still bearing children and raising them so like what does that change about this society and the way that like that men and women function in it um or like there there are gay characters who are in this this matriarchal society where it's like okay so if you're a gay man in a matriarchy uh mm -hmm. like what does that look like especially in a, a like nominally straight sort of very codified gender binary society mm -hmm. like how like thinking about the details of how that works and i i brought in like a bunch of stuff from um from like doing research about ancient greece and rome and how like gender and sexuality mm -hmm. were treated then which had a lot to do with like age and societal position but it wasn't like I was like, I have to get this right. So I'm going to really dig into how like how this works. The right. research was all the research, the hard, heavy research that I did was like, OK, so during the Iran-Contra crisis, like who was buying what from whom and how did mm -hmm. it affect interpersonal, the interpersonal relationships of the people who were involved in the like high stakes Interesting. Okay. political gamesmanship? Um, or like, how did political shifts affect actual people's daily lives in, <laughs> in like, uh, the third book is about a society that's trying to rebuild itself from complete political collapse. Mm -hmm. um, and like, a fascist takeover and the defeat of the fascists. And now it's like, we don't have a government, we have like a provisional government, what mm -hmm. rises to fill this void? And I asked someone, one of my students, actually, I was like, what does rise to fill the void in a situation like that? And he was like, oh, capitalist oligarchy. So I did a bunch <laughs> of research about capitalist oligarchy. And I was like, what countries can I use as examples? And it was like, oh, well, Russia or South Korea or to a certain extent, Ireland, like oh. after the not like right now but right. but sort of like in the weird period where it was like is ireland a country is it not we don't know right. um right. 
there was a lot of interesting stuff to be gleaned from like when your country is is in that position like who who takes the power how do they get it what happens after so like the research yeah. that i was doing was about things like that which i don't have personal experience of mm -hmm. uh, except i'm gaining personal experience of living in a capitalist oligarchy every day uh, <laughs> yeah but, well, do you um well, one question. <laughs> yes, did Kelly. Do... I looked out my window and I saw a capitalist. <laughs> did you um, uh, did you research uh, the Balkan conflict at all while you were writing these books? Not really, but it was really interesting. So, so Memediv, who is like the the secretary who turns into a like uh, turncoat and sort of destroys destroys the government basically because he is part of this sort of uh, conspiracy of people seeking to gain political power for their weird little nation state that wants to secede and become its own thing. I was really thinking about the Balkans without doing a lot of research about them. And I didn't, until you asked me this question, I was like, why, why didn't I do research about that? And now I'm thinking it's because I first became like aware of global events during like the war in Kosovo and, and like in the nineties, it was such, it was such like a present thing that was happening that I don't think was ever explained to me, but I only became aware of kind of later that there was this entire region of the world that was like small countries shifting a lot of the time. Uh, one of my friends in high school, her father was like an expert in the, oh man, I don't remember now. An expert in some like small Balkan country and it's like mm -hmm. conflict with some other small Balkan country. Okay. But it's like something that I didn't look into a lot. I was just aware that this is like a political situation that exists in our world and not just the Balkans, like in a lot of places around the world, there are all these sort of like little, little political, geopolitical sort of like groups and factions that are really <laughs> striving for things that they really believe that they should have. And, and that it causes like this, this like bubbling of violence mm -hmm. and so in in the Amberlo dossier world i was like obviously that will be happening like mm -hmm. it will be happening for memative it happens for um for the like north and south liso's like civil war split situation where it's like yeah there's two countries uh one of them is a monarchy the other was like we want democracy um, so we're going to secede, but we're going to get aid from like an, another like nominally democratic nation that will then fight like a puppet war, right? It, it's stuff that I don't feel like I understand in our world, but I know that it happens. And so I can take the shape of it and be like, if I do enough research about like Vietnam War or Iran-Contra or the British intervention in the Middle East or like literally anything that has happened right. in in the world in like the last i don't know 500 years i can be like oh i recognize that if i do enough research about it i can create a credible version of it in a fantasy world like i couldn't explain to you you know the balkan conflict i couldn't explain to you all of the intricacies of the Vietnam War or like British imperialism in Ireland. But I can read enough about it that I'm like, I understand mm -hmm. the underlying right. human motivation of this conflict. Mm -hmm. And so I can write a, a version of it with humans, yeah. but make up the details, right? Like that's my downfall when it comes to historical research is like, I don't <laughs> feel like I know enough to tell you a story set in this very real place. Right. What about interviews? Do you ever do include interviews in your research? Like reading interviews with people? Or, or uh, oral histories? Oh, interviewing. Or conducting interviews yourself? Interviewing other people. I haven't actually, but I have this book I kind of want to work on that is set in the early 50s. 
-hmm. And there are definitely people who are still alive who were there in the early 50s, yeah. uh, including like members of my own family. So if I do work on this book, I think I will probably just for like, what is life like, right? Because I can read about, mm -hmm. I can read about like, this is what the Korean War did to the US economy. Sure. But I can't be like, how was your like, when you went to school? How did you get there? Right. Like, what, what kind of breakfast? shoes did you wear? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, like what swear words did you use? That's right. one that I'm always like fascinated That's by. Cool. I have a great dictionary of slang. That's like from the sixties. It's fantastic. Mm. Um, I might tap you for it. Like, can I read your sixties slang in. dictionary? Yeah. <laughs> I think you can <laughs> really throw, tuned. you can throw people off if you're like a swear word and they're like, did people say that then? And it's like, right. well, have you looked? Yeah. There's this amazing Actually, website. It's even better. It's a slang thesaurus. Ooh, ooh, I like that. Awesome. Yeah. There's this amazing website that this this one, one true hero has compiled all of the like sex slang words from like the 1300s till now. Wow. And it's actually pretty incredible to be like, oh, people were still using the same. They use the same like sex words that we use now in yeah. like 1487. Well, the process hasn't changed that much. <laughs> no, this is true. <laughs> Though people like to believe that it has. They're like, oh, no one did people that like in the that past. invented all kinds of things. Um, before we go, because I think we've only got a couple minutes, tell me about your incredible earrings that you're wearing. Oh, my incredible earrings. Here, let me get you a, a neutral background They're to observe that. Earrings, huh? They're nude lady earrings. Though one of I my coworkers that. looked at them and he was like, is that supposed to be like a face wearing ski goggles? I don't understand. <laughs> it's like they're naked women. Uh, what does he, what does he read under the covers? <laughs> Not the sex slang dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> I got the eyeglass catalogs. <laughs> called Raha Jewelry, R A H A. Uh, I saw them at like one of those Christmas gift fairs that pop up around New York around the holidays. And I was like, I was actually there on a research mission because a perfume company that I really liked was going to have a booth. And I was like, I want to go smell them. And I am writing a book about perfumes right now. So I was like, I'll write it off for tax purposes if I buy one, which I did. But while I was there, I walked past their booth and was like, oh my God, are those earrings shaped like naked women? I must have one. And they were <laughs> in the same uh, sort of mode as when I was at FlameCon earlier in the summer. And I saw some giant earrings shaped like dead fish. And I was like, I must have the giant dead fish earrings okay. also. Yeah. Uh, so I think my next decade, so I just turned 30 this year, and I vowed that my next decade would be the like giant earring and turtleneck decade where I look like a like weird gallery owner who only wears black turtlenecks but wears yeah. very large sculptural well, earrings. Short hair and, and big earrings is a good combo. Yeah, though sometimes it looks kind of weird because you're like, it doesn't balance quite right. You have to have the right... You have to have the right things down here if you're going to have the tiny hair and the big earrings. Right, right. Um, okay, I think we're going to get kicked off in a minute, but thank you, Lara. This is an absolute pleasure. Thank you. I'm sorry for all the technical difficulties earlier, oh, but... Okay, I mean, we're, we're figuring this all out and everyone's kind of in the same boat anyway. It's a brave new time. Yeah, lots of love to you and Elliot and to your, your, your new little pet, huh? Yes, Koki. We named her Koki. After, after the vermouth. We kind of, so the story, I'm going to take like one more minute to explain this story. We got this cat and we we're like, what should we name her? And we we're like, we, we both love James Bond. So we kind of wanted to name her after a James Bond character. But she's also a very inquisitive, smart, like little girl cat. And we we're like, we should name her after some smart, inquisitive woman. Uh, and then we were like, oh, there are no good James Bond character names for this cat. And also it feels weird to name her after like an um, actual person. Pussy Galore is a pretty good name for a cat. <laughs> I personally would feel weird calling my cat Pussy Galore. But we have friends who have a cat named Chinzano. And we were like, that's a great name for a cat. What, yeah. like, Amari do we enjoy Perfect. that we can name our cat after? And I was like, oh, we could call her Koki Americano because it is a good substitute for Kina Lele, which isn't made anymore and is a key ingredient in a Vesper. So we'll call yeah. her Koki. And then she can kind of be named after Cokie Roberts, the journalist. So okay. 